Okay. Það er með sönn ánægja að kynna doktor professor Stephen Hawkins hér í dag en hann er í doktorsnefndinni hennar Lilju sem er í þörungunum með hún Karli Gunnar Sinni en hann er einmitt sá sem að reyði mig eitt málstofustjónum til starfa í Englandi á sínum tíma þegar ég fór í mastersnám 2008 nei 2007 sig þannig að eins og ég segi þá er það mér mikil ánægja að kynna hann hérna inn Yes, so I'm going to switch to English so Steve knows what I'm talking about. So I just wanted to introduce you, and I was telling them that uh, you hired me as your assistant back in 2007, which was a great honor. Uh, but he's going to talk about uh, the effects of the environmental effects of uh, the oil carrier, is that the English name? Tanker, Torrey Canyon, when it uh, there was an accident in two, uh, 1967, was it not? Uh, where a lot of oil went into the ocean and they're gonna tell us, or he's gonna tell us what happened afterwards with the environment. So, here we go. And this is pointer here. Okay. okay. This one? Yeah. All right. Okay, it's very, very nice to be back here again. I, I come to Iceland occasionally. The last time I was here, it was in, two, in this room was in 2000. And, nine. and it's uh, great to see old friends and people I'm from who uh, we got to play for the NBA cricket team. So perhaps one of the few Icelanders that's played cricket. And she looked very nice in the white uniform. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about um, the Torrey Canyon oil spill, uh, which occurred in 1967. But it's a, it's a more complicated story than that. I'm going to talk about recovery from the oil spill and interactions with uh, climate-driven fluctuations on rocky shores and with other impacts, particularly tributyl tin pollution, we think. So it's a story about the interaction of, uh, of a local acute pollution incident with global environmental fluctuations and a regional-scale pollutant, uh, tributyl tin, which was very prevalent in the 1980s and early 1990s. And lots of people have been involved in this work. Um, Ali Evans and Catherine Pack had the, the dodgy job of going through my filing system, which are big cardboard boxes with data on the side, trying to find all the information. And um, I was 11 at the time of the Torrey Canyon oil spill. I can remember seeing it on the TV. It happened near to where I live in, in uh, where I lived in Devon, uh, in the southwest of England, and being very excited as the RAF tried to blow the oil tanker up to uh, burn the oil and not doing a very good job actually. Um, so I've been involved in this work since 1980 and my old boss Alan Southwood got me involved in this work and uh, Eve Southwood, his wife who's still alive, was also involved in, in working this work up. We, we were going through lots of archival photographs, many of which I'm going to show you today. And these are other people that, uh, that have helped with the, the long-term work over the years. And I'm going to get my thanks in first. I was actually funded for this work by the International Tanker Owners Pollution Federation, which is a bit like sort of Thunderbirds, for those who are old enough to remember Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds for oil spills that go around and, and try to sort things out when an oil spill occurs and make sure that the tanker owners don't get sued too much uh, in terms of uh, pollution damage. And I've had some funding for some years European Union, which sadly is going to lapse, much to my chagrin, in the next couple of years. Um, recently, it's very difficult to fund long, thin work. So a lot of this work has been funded by my slush fund. So every time I do any um, refereeing or grant panel work, I ask them not to give the money to me, but to give it to the Marine Biological Association. So some of this work has been funded by the Icelandic Research Council, um, where my fee has been donated to the MBA, and it usually pays for about one year's field work, so that's, that's, that's quite good. Um, but it's difficult to get long, thin funding, and it's great that institutions like this do do long-term studies of, of the ocean. So this is a, a retrospective from 50, actually 51 years later now. I'm going to talk about timescales of, re of recovery. I'm going to talk about how during the recovery there was interactions with... Uh, with climate fluctuations and more recent 
uh, rapid climate change and tributyl tin pollution from anti-fouling paints. Um, and my take-home message, which I'm going to make now, is without long-term and broad-scale observations, you have no chance of unravelling global drivers from regional and uh, local scale impacts. And you also need this long-term view to actually understand the kind of recovery processes which occur following uh, pollution incidents or any other extreme environmental perturbation. So that's the Torrey Canyon. This, this picture is not stretched because of, you know, a bad image. Actually, this boat was stretched when they made it. Um, and this, this boat and the other one were very accident-prone boats. This was the first generation of super tankers. Um, uh, they didn't have uh, twin hulls. They had none of the safety mechanisms that you get in oil tankers these days. And this was after it uh, hit the rocks on the 18th of March, uh, 1967. And it was one of the first super tankers. It had over 100,000 tonnes of uh, oil was spilt, clearly an acute pollution incident. But it was made much, much worse by inappropriate treatment. And it's uh, one of these cases of the, uh, the treatment being much worse than, than the original illness. And this is because there was an excessive application of first generation highly toxic dispersants. And that's a euphemism. Basically, these were organic cleaning fl uh, fluids that had previously just been used for clearing up patches of oil around oil, oil um, refineries uh, in, in, in an industrial setting. And the biggest irony of it, of it all was the oil was uh, BP's oil, which was then a nationalised industry, and the dispersants were made by BP. <laughs> so they, they sold the dispersants to clean up their mess. And it's always a problem with nationalised industries of exactly you know, where the blame sits. And in, in Cornwall alone, 10,000 tonnes of dispersant were applied on 14,000 tonnes of oil. So an awful lot of organic solvent, uh, largely organic solvent, was, was applied to oil on the shore. And forget all the small words, but just to put it into perspective, this is the, the, the amount of oil which was, which was probably spilt somewhere in over 100,000 tonnes. The Amoco Cadiz in Brittany was a very, very big spill. But the Torrey Canyon is, is up there in the top five of, of large spills. There was a lot of fuss about the Exxon Valdez, but that was only 38,000 tonnes of, of oil. So it was, a, it was a big spill, and a lot of it did come ashore. So it was a, a Liberian registered ship, and the crew were having breakfast on autopilot to Milford Haven when it happened to hit some rocks which they'd forgotten about, um, just to the uh, east of the Isles of Scilly. And um, from an early, early time, there was a lot of political interference because the then Prime Minister, Howard, uh, Harold Wilson, had a holiday home, a summer house on the Isles of Scilly. And he took a lot of interest in this. Um, so there was a lot of top-down interference and, and the feeling that something had to be done. And subsequently, with the winds, they all hit this part of the coast and quite a lot of it ended up on the French coast as well. Uh, near Roscoff, and particularly slightly to the east of Roscoff and south of Brest, and also in the, uh, the British Channel Islands. And of course it's uh, an emergency, so what do you do? You send in the armed forces. In this case, the, uh, the RAF that tried to bomb the wreck didn't work very well. The, the Navy were involved at sea, tracking the oil and spraying it at, at, at sea. And the army were involved, uh, clearing the oil on sandy beaches and also spraying lots and lots of dispersant. And our armed forces are very good at doing things. They're not very good about thinking about what they're doing necessarily. So there was really excessive application of, uh, of dispersants. These people are having a competition here to see how high up the wall they can get. And this is one of my study sites which we, um, we've been looking at since 1967. And this is the site where we have the best set of data. And it was really very, very heavily sprayed with these dispersants. 
So we've got 50 years of data for the Torrey Canyon with a few gaps. You can work out the statistical likelihood of uh, freezer failures looking at this data set. I've had three freezer failures and lost the samples over the 50 years. Um, and we've got about 30 years of data with some big holes uh, on recovery from tributyl um, tin pollution. So we, we've got some, some fairly decent long-term data. And the MBA, um, founded in 1888, uh, the whole laboratory was mobilised to deal with the oil spill in 1967. There was no environment agency in those days, and the whole lab was mobilised. Um, even the physiologists got involved, came out of the laboratory and did some work. And, and this book is still quite a good read. It was edited by the director. These days, there'd be many, many authors. In those days, the director of the lab just was the first author, and everybody else did the work. Um, but it's still quite a good read, and uh, it, it's an interesting read of the acute phase of the oil spill. Now, one of the things that they had a problem with was that none of the companies would tell them what was in their magic cleaning fluids, the dispersants. There was no product labelling in the 1960s. But all the different dispersants which were used, and these are detergent 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, they all contained an, ar an aromatic organic solvent, uh, usually from petroleum um, cracking, a surfactant, the, the dispersant, and some kind of stabiliser, usually palm oil or something like that. So they were most the same, but the solvent was, you know, 75% solvent with lots of aromatics, 85% kerosene extract, 75% uh, solvent. So it was a case of, um, of pouring hydrocarbon products on, on troubled waters. Um, a, a lot of this stuff came from um, hydrocarbons and was being used as organic solvents. So the MBA is famous for long-term observing, and um, Alan and Eve Southwood have got a whole series of sites all around the southwest which they've been monitoring for many years. And the ones with the black blobs are the ones which are affected by the oil. And the, the, the open ones are sites they had long-term data from uh, which were not affected. Uh, that's where I was brought up in Devon. And um, for those of you that are fans of British television, um, this is where Doc Martin comes from. Uh, Poldark is all the way around here. So they weren't involved in the sampling. Though. So... Um, we, we had, there's a lot of data from Crisp and Southwood and also the uh, French guy, Fisher Piet, in the 40s and 50s. Alan Southwood uh, had a time series of barnacles until he retired in 1987. Uh, I've got a time series for limpets from 1980. Actually, we did it this year, so I need to update that slide for 2018. And by accident, this was actually quite a good experimental design. It was actually an unplanned before-after control and impact study because there were clean sites, dirty sites, and there was data mainly on barnacles um, from before the oil spill. And the other thing which is interesting is that five generations of um, scientists, some of whom I'm going to show, there was D.P. Wilson, Alan and Eve Southwood, Peter Gibbs, various other people, and then a newer generation of youngsters from the 1980s, me, Bill Langston, and then another generation of people that Hron met in, in Plymouth that are now PIs, and then some more recent people. In fact, um, I was Alan's student, and these are my students, and these are my students' students. <laughs> and this is some surveys being done in 1981. This is Alan Southwood, then in his 50s, and this is D.P. Wilson, who was famous for working on worms, but also used to photograph the shore here, and he was then in his 80s, so this is D.P. Wilson taking a photograph uh, on, on the shore in 1981. And after such hard work, one has to have a cup of tea afterwards. So this is Eve Southwood then in her, her 50s, and this is D.P. Wilson after they did the sampling in 1991, and Alan Southwood took this photograph. And Eve, who's 88 now, has been helping me in a lot of the data recovery. Now, just to put things into context. Um, this is data on sea surface temperature off Plymouth since the 1870s, early records by the Navy. The MBA lab was founded in 1888. And it's a very messy trace. There was a warm period. It was very cold either side of the First World War. 
So there was then a period of warming up to about 1959-60, and then the 1960s and the 1970s and 1980s were a very cold period. We had a very cold winter, 62-63. That's the first time I saw snow as a seven-year-old. Uh, sorry, as a six-year-old in, uh, in Weymouth on the south coast. And the 1960s were notoriously, um, 1960s, 70s and early 80s, a notoriously cool period. Think flared trousers, synthesizer music, this kind of stuff. And then about 1988, it started getting warm again. Lots of North Atlantic oscillation uh, positive winters. And then in more recent years, there's been a bit of a downturn. We've had a, a couple of North Atlantic oscillation negative winters with a strong continental influence. And it, uh, 2010 was uh, the coldest winter since 1963. So we have had some colder weather recently. Um, so an awful, lot of, um, an awful lot of noise, as well as some kind of climate signal, which I think is probably due to global climate change. And there's pretty good evidence of this. This is data from IPCC. This is one of the earlier IPCCs, but I like this graph because it shows that actually there was a cool period before this period of rapid warming, and you need to know what went on in the 30s and 40s to put current changes into perspective. And this is for the Northern Hemisphere. You can see it was warm, cool, and then getting much, much warmer. There, of course, are some alternative hypotheses. Um, not published in the peer-reviewed literature, but on Twitter. I like this one. The concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. Um, this one particularly offends me. Um, windmills are the greatest threat in the US to both bald and golden eagles. Media claims fictional global warming is worse. It really offends me because the grammar is so bad. <laughs> um, I also wonder whether a, um, whether a golden eagle is a bald eagle with a comb over. There's no one from the CIA here, is there? Okay, um, this was published in the, um, the Straits Times of, of Singapore, actually, where they were very concerned. They're concerned about climate change because Singapore is a very low country and with sea level rise, it might not be there, or very much of that. So I think the global consensus, and this is from the IPCC, is that climate change is, is, is happening, and it's a fairly robust um, analysis. Now, this is Alan Southwood's barnacle data. The 1950s were a warm period. Cathalamus are warm water species, and they did very well in the 1950s. And the Semivalinus phalanoides, which occurs in Iceland, a northern species, did less well in the 50s, and during the 60s, 70s, and early 80s did better. There was a gap when Alan was forced to take early retirement. And then I resumed some of the counts in the 1990s, and uh, generally the warm water species are much more common than they had been in, in the 1950s. But interestingly, the cold water species were still persisting, um, which is an interesting observation. Now, the main effect of these first-generation toxic dispersants was to kill off limpets. And these are, these are big grazing mollusks which haven't got to Iceland yet. They've got to the Faroes, and apparently there's some subfossil material in the Vestman Islands so if they eventually do get to Iceland, they'll make Cali redundant because they'll eat all the seaweeds and there'll be nothing, there'll be nothing left for, for Cali to study. And these are a keystone species which control algal vegetation on most of the shores of the northeast Atlantic where they occur. Um, and these limpets were very much killed by the oil spill, but particularly by the dispersants. The dispersants tended to, to do the killing. In fact, the limpets were able to eat the dried oil these limpet teeth marks on some dried oil. So the oil itself, crude oil, Q8 crude oil, wasn't that toxic. It was the dispersants that did most of the damage. Now, we know from experiments, uh, I was taught by Norman Jones on the Isle of Man, and Norman removed all the limpets in a strip down the seashore and then got the RAF to photograph it. This was a 10-yard, 10 10-meter-wide 10 strip, and he showed that uh, limpet grazing controlled algal vegetation. I was a very sceptical research student. I didn't really believe this. So I did my own little mini strip. This was 10 metres by 2 metres wide. <coughs> I, uh, I removed all the limpets. And then um, about nine months later, I was able to, being in the 1970s, I was able to induce a nice Mohican of, um, of fucus down the shore in the absence of the limpet grazing. 
And then sometime later, the limpets aggregated onto the seaweeds and left bare space either side where there weren't any grazers and the seaweeds proliferated on either side. So limpets have a very significant role. And I then did some experiments where I fenced out the limpets. These are the limpets here. This is the fenced area. This is the control area. And then six to nine months later, the area gets completely covered with seaweeds. This is a control. The only seaweeds are actually growing on the limpet shells themselves. They're not very good at grazing themselves. <laughs> so very, very powerful grazers controlling the algae on the seashore. So what happened after these massive kills of limpets? These are the shores which are affected by the oil. And um, these were very strongly sprayed. These are photographs taken by D.P. Wilson. This is before the spill in August 1966. And this is one of the shores we still study every year. This is when the dispersant was being um, sprayed. And then when all the limpets were killed, the first thing to colonise were lots and lots of green algae. Uh, the seaweed formerly called Entromorpha, now called Ulva, growing everywhere on the seashore in the absence of limpet grazing. And then a little bit later... The seashore, which was previously dominated by barnacles, became completely dominated by uh, fucoid seaweeds. In fact, beginning to look a bit like an Icelandic shore. Um, but this is in a very wave-exposed area. And a couple of years later, this thick canopy of seaweeds is actually a very good nursery ground for the baby limpets. And lots and lots of limpets settled from nearby, they have a larval stage, settled from nearby uncontaminated shores and really proliferated under this seaweed canopy as very good conditions for, for baby limpets of Patella vulgata. Um, this is what, um, a rock pool that he photographed. This is one year before. Calcareous algae, limpets, various mollusks. This is when it got killed. Green algae, green algae, lots of brown algae, lots of brown algae. Then lots of limpets that have been underneath the brown algae. And then um, the, the pool never really recovered. It never got back. Um, to what it looked like one year before. This is exactly the same rock pool. And then it was time for tea. <laughs> and returning to Port Leaven, where we've got some quantitative data, this was the most affected shore. Uh, they knew it was toxic because the, 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 the people that were doing the spraying, they put in rubber coats uh, to protect them. So they, they knew it was toxic. <coughs> and this is the time series here. This is one year after the oil spill. The seashore was completely... Previously, it was barnacle-dominated, completely covered by brown seaweeds. There was a brown seaweed phase for three or four years. And then it went very bare, covered with barnacles. And then um, barnacle-dominated. And then it went a bit seaweedy again. And then these are basically some snapshots giving the idea what the natural variation would be. Normally, these shores have mainly barnacles, but sometimes fucus, and in some years there's more seaweed than in other years. It fluctuates. So um, that's a close-up. That's the, the seaweed-dominated phase, and this is the, um, the bear phase, and that's what the bear phase looked like up until 1977. Um, and then, because so many limpets settled underneath the seaweeds, there was a massive population explosion and normally these animals home. They, 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 they go away and forage and they come back to a home scar. But when they were starving, they started behaving like lemmings and sort of migrating over the shore. They gave up their homing and they were eating everything that was in their path. And there was a migrating front of limpets. Um, and this large colonising cohort eventually died due to starvation. So if we look at some data... Uh, green seaweeds, brown seaweeds, fucus, a bare phase, and then getting back to sort of normal patchiness. Um, Alan Southfield and I reckoned it took about 15 years. I, I've been involved in this work since 1980. It took about 15 years to get back to normal. And these are limpet numbers, a big spike of limpets settling under the fucus, and then crashing, and then recovering. And this is a northern cold water species of limpet, and this is a southern species of limpet which recovered much, much more slowly than the cold water limpet. And this is the biomass, this is the big front and the, and the die off, and then more, the more slowly recovery of the warm water species. And I'm going to come back to talk about that later on.
So that's 1987, um, 20 years later, and you can see there's a few patches of seaweed. And the normal condition for shores is small patches of seaweed, mostly barnacle dominated, and the amount of fucus fluctuates from year to year. Sometimes there's very little, sometimes 30, 40% cover. So you get these, these fluctuations. That's 1997. Uh, this is just a close-up in more detail of what's going on. This is time zero, or ground zero, when the dispersant had been applied. There's a little bit of fucus in patches, lots of green algae, huge amounts of seaweed of fucus, lots of seaweed after four years, beginning to break up again, and then going very, very bare because of this vast, these vast numbers of limpets eating everything up. And this is the bare phase 10 years afterwards. And this is the, uh, the frontal limpets. Now, there was one seashore, Gadrivi, which had some seals. And because of the seals, the National Trust, which is a British conservation charity and landowner, didn't allow them to spray dispersants there. So this was the only seashore amongst these contaminated ones where there wasn't a lot of dispersant spraying and the oil coated the rock it killed some limpets but not all, not all of them most of the barnacles survived and six six months later there was not a lot of green algal growth there wasn't a proliferation of, of entomorpha over after six months because most of the limpets had survived and the limpets were actually able to help clean the shore up these are their individual tooth marks and they're actually feeding on the dried um, Q8 oil which wasn't uh, that toxic it was crude oil and this shore got back to normal within two to three years it got back to patches of mussels and limpets and barnacles so on the, the one shore which wasn't sprayed recovery time was probably two to three years so these are various shores with different degrees of spraying and this is the heavily treated one more than 10 years probably more like 15 years and the untreated shore, back to normal within about two to three years because the crude oil was just not very, dis not, not very toxic compared to the dispersants. Now, an interesting question is, what about the slow recovery of this species of limpet, Patella depressa, the southern warm water one? Very, very slow indeed. And you know, if you wanted to be someone who was a, an environmentally alarmist, you could say, oh, recovery is really slow, this species hasn't come back. But... We actually know that this was probably due to interaction with climate because during the 60s, 70s and early 80s it was a cold period and this species was much rarer than it had been in the 1950s. And um, the open circles of data for the warm water species in the 1950s when it was quite abundant. I did a survey between 1980 and 1984 and the the, um, the black blobs are the abundance in all these sites. Afterwards, if it's like this, it was the same sort of abundance. And generally, in most of it, and that's the northern limit in Europe, um, generally at most sites, it was less abundant, particularly the ones around here where the oil spill was, than it had been in the 1950s. So the reason this one didn't recover was partly due to it wasn't doing very well generally due to it being a colder weather due to climate fluctuations in the 60s and 70s. We also now know from work that uh, Pitt Moore did that um, Patella vulgata likes being underneath um, fucus clumps. So these are, these are fucus patches. This is a slide I must have been talking in America because I was calling it rockweed, um, rack. Um, and you get more Patella vulgata underneath clumps of fucus than you do uh, on open rock. And the southern species is the other way around. It doesn't like being under clumps of seaweed. Um, and we've done experiments which shows that Patella vulgata um, dies if you remove the clumps of seaweed or migrates to other clumps, whereas Patella depressa, the southern species, is pretty indifferent to fucus and does less well under fucus. So how did Patella depressa do when it got warmer? Um, from the 1980s onwards. Well, that's the first time we published the data, and then we did an update in 2006, and there's continuation of fluctuations of fucus. There was a big recruitment event of fucus in 2000, 
but patella depressa, the warm water species, which is the, the, open, circle, the open squares, did much, much better after about 88 when it started getting warmer. Um, but if there's any fucus, if fucus comes in, then patella vulgata makes a recovery. So there's two things going on here. There's the effect of climate affecting patella depressa, but if there's a, fu a natural fucus escape, patella vulgata does, does better and we think the northern species beats up the southern species. It tends to be more competitive underneath fucus clumps. And this is data we collected in uh, up to 2016. This is a fucus canopy, big perturbation, natural fluctuations, the occasional big <coughs> recruitment event. Uh, there's these sort of natural cycles going on. This is patella vulgata recovering and becoming rarer in terms of numbers as it got warmer and the warm water species um, doing better, except in years when there was lots of fucus, with the fucus facilitating the cold water species, which we think is more competitive under fucus clumps than the, than the, um, than the warm water species. And this was on the 50th anniversary of the oil spill, and I think to celebrate, the shore decided to have lots and lots of fucus. <laughs> so there's a big fucus recruitment event going on at the moment. Um, totally natural fluctuations, and maybe up to 50% uh, cover of fucus uh, in the area. So uh, that's the 2017 data. And in 2018, I haven't put 2018's data on yet, it was about there. This peak was just beginning to subside again. These, these recruitment events lead to about two to three years of fucus, and it eventually diminishes because the limpets munch away at the rock, uh, at the holdfasts. Now, this is a paper I've never written for Nature, um, which is this winter's uh, project. Um, it'll end up in JMBA, probably. Um, and this is looking at the dynamics of the numbers and the biomass of the limpets. And this is plotting limpet numbers against seaweed cover. And this is when it's perturbed. Um, this is going towards some kind of envelope of normal. And then occasionally there's natural recruitment events which go outside the envelope and then come back down within this envelope. So there's no such thing as a baseline. It's very wobbly. And there's sort of an envelope of probability uh, which, which occurs on these shores. And these are the, this, this is the total limpet biomass of Volgata and Depressa. And as soon as you get a spike of seaweed, you can see that the biomass of Patella Volgata goes up. They're bigger than the southern species and you get this peak, and then that tends to depress the, the, the warm water depressor. So you get these quite complicated fluctuations going on. And that just shows it in a bit more detail. That's a big spike. The death due to lots and lots of uh, starvation and uh, inter-age class interactions. And then another little peak when there was this natural fucus recovery. And patella depressor coming back in and generally doing well, except when there's lots of fucus, lots of seaweed. And that's the, the density of limpets against the biomass. Um, you can see the spike here. Intense interage class interactions, meaning no recruitment. Another shoot over here, some kind of stabilization. Then an excursion outside here when there was the, uh, the, the natural outburst in 2000 of seaweeds. And then, yeah, this is what sort of normal is, but it wobbles a lot. Um, and this is mainly driven by, by Volgata, the cold water species. Depressor are, are really um, not significant players in, what, in what's going on in terms of the total limpet biomass because they're smaller. So we've got interactions of climate fluctuations. Um, the, the warm water species was slow coming back in the 60s and 70s. It also didn't like lots of seaweed, which was unfavourable. So this slowed recovery of patella depressa. And recovery of this species only really occurred when it got warmer, post-87, and when the seaweeds became much rarer following recovery from the oil spill. Now, another puzzle is this very cute hermit crab, um, which is very common in France. And this disappeared during the Torrey Canyon oil spill, but it's, it's, it's more complicated than this. And why was it so slow to come back? 
And every year, we, we used to go searching for this hermit crab. We used to take Eve south with us on the beach. We used to say, that's where it used to be. Um, and it was very, very slow to recover. Now, this species was a, a new hermit crab to Britain. It was discovered by this guy, a schoolboy on the seashore. He got in touch with a lab. You could get papers in Nature in those, those days for Nature. Um, and this species um, appeared, and then it disappeared when it got cold again in the 19, um, 1970s and 80s. But why didn't it come back again from the late 1980s onwards? Why was it so slow to recover? Well, we think this is partly due to two things. Perhaps poor dispersal. It had to come across the channel from France when it got completely wiped out in the UK. But its preferred shell is of dog whelk shells. And in the 19 80s and 1990s, when it was getting warm again, there were very few dog whelk shells because these were very badly affected by tributyl tin um, pollution. And just to remind people what happens, um, female dog whelks become masculinized, they grow a vas deferens, they grow a penis, and the vas deferens proliferates and blocks the female genital duct, leaving to, leading to reproductive failure and eventually death of, of, of the dog whelks. Um, uh, this was mainly from uh, recreational um, use of the tank. This is work done at the MBA. Um, sometimes the tabloid press is important in getting messages into policy. Um, lady whelks get the willies. This probably had more influence on, um, on policy than these very technical papers, but that was the headline that may have led to the paint being banned in the UK. So... You can measure contamination by looking at the relative penis size. You can look at the relative size of the female penis divided by those of the males in the population. And it's possible to tell whether it's a female or not because dog whelks do multiple mating and they have a sperm ingesting gland where they store sperm from multiple males. So even if it's got a penis, you can see whether it's a female or not if it's got a sperm ingesting um, uh, aperture. So this just gives you an idea of just how badly affected um, the shore was, this is one of our control sites at Wembury um, for, the t for the oil spill near Plymouth. Very bad. This is, the, this is the relative penis size of the females in the population versus the males. And a lot of these sites around here in particular on the south coast, the, the dog whelks are very, very affected and they became very rare. Now, we haven't got much long-term monitoring for this, but we've got some sites around Plymouth. We've got a control site in North Cornwall, just up the road is uh, uh, Port Wen. Um, and uh, these are contaminated sites and naval dockyards, commercial fishing boats, marinas. And this is data from uh, three, PH, three PhD students. Um, and then couldn't get funding anymore. Um, so this shows recovery in the contaminated sites in terms of relative penis size. This is the control site, and this is more recently. There was still some legacy pollution, I think, due to contaminated sediments from the naval dockyards that were being dumped off, offshore. Um, so clearly there was an effect in the, in the 1980s when perhaps um, the hermit crab could come back. So this is... The hermit crab, this is Marazine, which is affected by the Torrey Canyon. A lot of them got killed. There was a bit of recovery, and then they, they died away in the, at this site in the 1980s. This was not affected by the Torrey Canyon, and you can see the population declining and disappearing. And this decline is just caused by cooler weather. These animals were just not reproducing any... Any larvae weren't coming across from France. The local populations weren't sustaining them. So the reason this was so slow to recover was because, basically, it was cooler for this species. This is a warm water species. Now, we've been looking for them every year and never found them. But some amateur naturalists um, found them in 2016. They alerted Eve, and we went out and found them as part of our, um, as part of our surveys. Um, and they were coming back. And you can see that they're mainly in dog whelk shells, but also in 
uh, Nazarius or Hinia shells, and this is another species badly affected by uh, TBT pollution. So what we think is happening here is um, they came back again, probably 2015. We found one at Wembury. We found a few more last year. So it's come back in, in Devon. Um, it recruited during a warm period. It then got zapped by the Torrey Canyon uh, and very, 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 very little recovery. And during this period here was at the height of TBT. Um, very few dog whelk shells. So even if there was a recruitment from France, um, there would have been no, no decent homes for it. And then eventually it came back again. So possibly an interaction of uh, climate fluctuations with pollution and with uh, TBT. So it's interesting to put pollution into context. Uh, and it depends what your time frame is. If, you were, if your time frame was from um, when Alan Southwood started in 1950 and uh, when he stopped being active in about 1999. It was a period of it when it was warm, it then got cold and then got warm again. Um, the Torrey Canyon recovery may be 15 years, most shores, a, a pulse disturbance, TBT, a press disturbance. But these are quite short disturbances against all this background affecting species through, through recruitment fluctuations. So an interesting question is, what is recovery from an oil spill? And th this is one of the officially adopted um, explanations. It's returned to conditions that would have prevailed if the spill had not occurred. And you need to, know, you need to have this background broad-scale data to know what else is going on to be able to, to understand what would be going on if the spill had not occurred. And what was interesting when we wrote this work up for the Marine Pollution Bulletin in 2017 is we could find very, very few prolonged studies of recovery in the published literature. Funders give up after the acute phase. No one's interested in looking at things and, and, and getting to understand what local wobbles are um, afterwards. And I suppose, again, it's very difficult to assess recovery without broad-scale surveys and long-term monitoring because there's other stuff going on. And you can very easily point your finger at the, at the wrong uh, culprit. In fact, in the popular press, um, this, this hermit crab, when it reappeared, actually got on BBC's Spring Watch, and they had a competition to name the hermit crab. Um, because it had been found in Cornwall, they named it after a Cornish saint, St. Pyrrhon, who's an Irish monk who paddled. You know, you've heard these stories about Irish monks getting everywhere paddled across the Irish Sea and, and, and established a small church somewhere in Cornwall. Now, that's wrong because it was always found in Devon over the border in the Anglo-Saxon part of the British Isles, not the Celtic part of the British Isles. So the, the name was wrong anyway. But local people were saying, oh, it's a Torrey Canyon oil spill. It never came back 20, 30 years. Rubbish. It was because of climate fluctuations and possibly because of um, TBT pollution, the reason it didn't come back. But people are saying, oh, you know, the all speed stuff. Anyway, you've got, to, you've got to have data. So w when we did our literature review, we found that the Torrey Canyon is one of the places with, with some of the longest studies. But then we were only really able to keep this work going on just one shore. Amoco Cadiz, maybe seven to eight years on treated shores. Exxon Valdez nine years. The Exxon Valdez was interesting because they didn't spray toxic dispersants, but they had lots and lots of people that went down and cleaned everything up. But the trampling damage of all the people was as bad as the toxic dispersants. Um, with the Amoco Cadiz, they didn't want to use toxic dispersants, so they used steam cleaning because it was non-toxic. But of course, steam cleaning didn't poison the limpets, it just boiled them. <laughs> <laughs> and it had the same effect. So, um, so sometimes, you know, good motives um, can get in the way of a, a sensible decision if you, if you don't know the biology. Um, the CM press may be five years where there was some dispersant population. So it's difficult to get people to, to study things long term. So just to finish, you need to consider all impacts, climate change, fishing, non-natives, habitat loss, as well as pollution. 
There's no such thing as a simple baseline because of long-term variability, often driven by climate fluctuations, upon which more recent climate change is superimposed. Um, studies of recovery are very important, but no one funds them. Um, the good news is that marine ecosystems do recover rapidly as they are open, and as long as there's colonisation from remote sources, um, recovery can be quite rapid. Though, with Ascophyllum, if you remove the whole plant, recovery can be very slow. Agnar and I set up an experiment in 1985, and recovery here in Iceland, the recovery was very slow, but we removed the whole plant. And things were getting more or less back to normal in about 15 years, I think. From that work. Now, the work that I'm involved with with Kale and with, um, with Lilia, where they're just chopping the top off, then I think recovery is going to be much more rapid. And the, you think it's about four to five years before it gets back to normal. So, marine, marine ecosystems do recover rapidly as long as you don't do stupid things like inappropriate <coughs> treatment. This can really delay recovery. And without long term, broad scale stuff, it's very easy to make erroneous interpretations of impacts and come up with the wrong idea of when recovery may or may not happen. Now, in Europe, that doesn't matter very much, but in America, it matters a lot because there's lots of lawsuits going on. And uh, obviously, length of rec recovery time is one of the things that, uh, that uh, those people that cause oil spills get, get sued. So there is some interest in, in recovery processes. And the final thing is, the Torrey Canyon was such a, there's only one way, to, a, a British word, such a cock-up. Um, there's no other way of saying it. Um, it was, there was overreaction. By the time the oil got to the French side of the channel, which was two to three weeks, the French had a much more nuanced approach. They applied hay to the oil. They then collected the hay. They then burnt the oil. They didn't spray on exposed shores and winds and waves did the work for them and um, there was a much more subtle treatment. They also used lots of champagne chalk on, on, they sprinkled it on the oil at sea and sunk it which is bad for the seabed so in the two to three weeks for the oil to get across the channel the French dealt with it much much better than, than the British but there's still, there's still a, a tendency to overreact. Politicians want to be seen to be doing something and sometimes you've got to be really firm and just say don't do anything. Wind and waves two to three years and it might be okay except of course when there's bird populations which can be very very vulnerable to this kind of oil. Um, but generally we're much better at it now, we're better at anticipating and dealing with oil spills today than 30-40 than, um, years ago but they, they still do occur. Anyway, thanks for your attention. My name is My name is Helgi Jansson, I come from the Environmental Agency and thank you very good uh, uh, presentation. My question is, uh, do you know any studies where oil spill in spawning areas have been studied? Um, because uh, that's an uh, other part, if it's a spawning area, it's more, yeah. it may be more sensitive than for long-term effects. I think, I think one of the the most important advances that have been made, um, I think one of the most important advances that's been made in the last 20 or 30 years is that most countries, most regions have, um, have oil spill contingency planning where um, shores, different types of habitats are ranked according to their vulnerability to oil spills. So estuaries, bays, nursery grounds, spawning grounds, um, particularly in soft sediment or salt marsh habitats, are much more vulnerable. Whereas on, on rocky shores, they're much less vulnerable. So 
generally, if there was a, an important fish nursery ground like an estuary, now a boom would be put over there to keep the oil out. Or if it was in tropics, if it was a mangrove, um, they, would, they would put a boom out. I mean, really, I'm a rocky shore ecologist. I'm not a pollution person. Um, but I don't know of, of many studies, but I do know that the approach now is to be much more uh, preventative and to identify very vulnerable areas and then try to stop oil getting there by using barrages or by spraying at sea rather than when it comes on onto the shore. And also the, the, the dispersants now are probably three orders of magnitude less toxic than what was used, which was basically you know, organic solvent. for a very interesting uh, lecture. Um, I have just one question for coming from my ignorance. With the limpets, isn't there, is no, no one who has taste for limpets? Didn't they have any other, any natural enemy that complicated your uh, study, like uh, birds or, or something else? Thank yeah. you. Uh, um, oyster catchers eat limpets. Um, and we've done some, some work on that, but it's maybe 5 10% mortality. And um, uh, the oyster catchers don't do very well underneath seaweed canopies. Um, people used to eat limpets in the um, Paleolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, and there's very nice middens, which actually are very good way of reconstructing climate change. You can look at the different species of warm water, cold water limpets over time, which I've done for archaeologists. Um, but in, in recent years in Britain, there's not so much use of, of limpets. Um, in the Azores and Canaries, any of you been on holiday to the Azores and Canaries? Uh, they eat limpets a lot. And actually, uh, I've done some work in the Azores um, where the, the, the limpets are basically endangered by, by over-exploitation by people. And they're particularly vulnerable because um, one of the species is a Protandrus hermaphrodite, and um, they're getting eaten faster than they can change sex, um, which is a very bad thing um, because they, uh, they, get, they become females about that size and they're getting eaten from about that size. But uh, we recently published a paper showing that there was actually some compensation because the sex change was density dependent. And in exploited populations, there was more rapid promotion from male to female. But there was some compensation, but only if it was light exploitation, heavy exploitation, they just disappear. But in this study, there was no major predators. And um, on more sheltered shores, crabs, feed on, on small limpets, uh, oyster catchers do. But once limpets get to about that size, they're pretty immune from, from most predators. Um, so there's, 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 there's not anything higher up the food chain interfering with them much. I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, so what do you, do you see climate change as a threat to rocky shore communities or do you just see it as something that's just going to change or what is the and then what is the biggest threat you would see to rocky shore communities in this area um, I, th I i mean I, I i accept that climate change is happening and i've been involved in other work about interactions of, of climate change and fishing um, and in the English Channel, and that work showed that overfishing was having much more of a structuring effect on the fish assemblages than climate change. Climate change was affecting the small fish, but not the big fish. The, 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 the larger bodied fish, overfishing was completely overriding any climate change signal in the English Channel. We published that in Global Change Biology in 2010. On rocky shores, um, changes are occurring. I mean, green crab are now 
in the, in the West Fjords, and they're, they're, moving, they're moving north. Um, the Fucus serratus here is expanding in range, so sp species are changing, and some cold water species are becoming rarer. So climate change will affect rocky shores. Um, I'm not so sure that it's, it's a threat, it's just something which is happening. And I think in Britain, our rocky shores will become to resemble much more like those in Spain and Portugal, in that they'll be dominated by barnacles and limpets, and they will be importing energy. Whereas, um, as you go further north in Europe, seaweeds do more, and, and rocky shores are exporters of energy. So it will have an effect on coastal ecosystems, but the effects are quite subtle. I think in terms of impacts on rocky shores, well, TBT was a very big impact, but it tended to just affect dog whelks. And we got lots of funding to look at the community consequences of this, and we haven't published any of it because we couldn't really find any community consequences, <laughs> and it's difficult to publish negative results. Um, so it, ha it had a very targeted effect on... On, on, on snails and when it was banned they recovered, it took 10 or 15 years but they recovered um, for me I think one of the biggest threats to rocky shores particularly in the Mediterranean is urbanisation leading to more silt if you've got a highly urbanised environment and you urbanise estuaries you get rid of fringing vegetation lots and lots of silt goes into the coastal zone and certainly in the Mediterranean this is having a big effect and seems to be turning um, canopy, fucoid canopy dominated areas with lots of cystocera into ones with just algal turfs, which trap the silt. So I think urbanization and siltation is important in the Mediterranean. Uh, I think an interesting effect in the coastal zone is proliferation of artificial sea defenses. With rising sea level, we're adapting by building defenses everywhere. And I think. In a way, it's quite good because it's more rocky shore, but it's artificial rocky shore, and it's highly impoverished rocky shore. So I think those impacts are probably greater than, than climate change. Um, so for me, in the Mediterranean, urbanisation on British shores, maybe proliferation of artificial habitat, impacting soft sediment communities, and then creating impoverished rocky shores. With, with low diversity. And climate change has effects, but they're not, they're not huge. They're subtle. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we're right on time then. So thank you very much for your Hi, talk. Thank you for having me.